We now welcome you to a CN Live special, a celebration of the 25th anniversary of Consortium News. I'm Joe Loria, the Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. And I'm Elizabeth Voss. On this day in 1995, Robert Parry, one of the country's leading investigative reporters, started a website on something called the internet that was like no other that had existed before. A quarter of a century later, it is still going. For the Associated Press and Newsweek, Bob had uncovered major stories. He blew the cover on Iran-Contra, one of the greatest scandals in U.S. history. He first reported on the CIA's relationship with the Nicaraguan Contras and their narcotics shipments to the United States. And he put the spotlight on the first October surprise in the 1980 presidential election. By revealing crimes and malfeasance by the U.S. government, that did not sit well with his mainstream editors. They tried spiking his stories. They set up absurd demands like asking Oliver North to confess and at one point told him to stop asking too many questions for the good of the country. After working on an October surprise documentary for PBS's Frontline, Bob left establishment journalism behind so that he could simply do his job unhindered. He found a like-minded consortium of journalists whose stories had also been suppressed to begin consortium news. It started on paper as a newsletter mailed to subscribers' homes, but on November 15, 1995, 25 years ago today, Bob launched the world's first independent news site. He beat Salon.com online by five days and established outlets like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal by several weeks. More importantly, though, Bob Parry was at the forefront of alternative online news that questioned establishment narratives and Washington conventional wisdom. He covered stories the mainstream media wouldn't and took angles on stories that were being ignored. With virtually no staff, besides the help of his sons and longtime assistant Chelsea Gilmore, Bob built a following and enough readers to fund the operation. Thousands came to depend on Bob's take on the news. A TV presenter once told Joe that he would wait to see what Bob had written that day before deciding what his show should be about. While Consortium News has never come close to being mass media, its audience attracted influential people in Washington and elsewhere. Bob wrote, Quote, the point of Consortium News, which I founded in 1995, was to use the new medium of the modern internet to allow the old principles of journalism to have a new home, i.e. a place to pursue important facts and give everyone a fair shake. But he added, more and more, I would encounter policymakers, activists, and yes, journalists, who cared less about a careful evaluation of the facts and logic, and more about achieving a preordained geopolitical result. And this loss of objective standards reached deeply into the most prestigious halls of American media. This perversion of principles, twisting information to fit a desired conclusion, he went on, became the modus vivendi of American politics and journalism. And those of us who insisted on defending the journalistic principles of skepticism and even-handedness were increasingly shunned by our colleagues, a hostility that first emerged on the right and among neoconservatives, but eventually sucked in the progressive world as well. Everything became information warfare. Bob continued to break stories about the Reagan era into the 1990s, including the existence of a secret perception management program run by the CIA from within the White House. With the 2003 invasion of Iraq, Consortium News became the home of the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, a consortium of former intel officers who exposed the faulty intelligence leading to the war. Like honest reporters just trying to do their jobs, Bob said, there were also honest intelligence officers trying to do the same. Bob wrote that Republicans started this downward trend in politics and in journalism by first weaponizing information to delegitimize their opponents. He wrote, quote, rather than accept the reality of Nixon's guilt, many Republicans simply built up their capability to wage informational warfare. He continued, the idea had developed that the way to defeat your political opponent was not just to make a better argument or rouse popular support, but to dredge up some crime that could be pinned on him or her. Soon the Democrats will be using the same tactics. He wrote, the trend of using journalism as just another front in no holds barred political warfare continued with Democrats and liberals adapting to the successful techniques pioneered mostly by Republicans. Thus Bob in just trying to do his job as a reporter became increasingly critical of the Democrats too. He wrote groundbreaking stories on the Obama administration's wars in Syria and Libya and especially on the US engineered coup in Ukraine. He was especially fierce about Democrats who lost their skepticism and embraced the intelligence agencies. He wrote, quote, ironically, many liberals who cut their teeth on skepticism about the Cold War and the bogus justifications for the Vietnam War now insist that we must all accept 
whatever the US intelligence community feeds us, even if we're told to accept the assertions on faith. Perhaps Consortium News and Bob's biggest story in 25 years was being in the forefront of skepticism on the now thoroughly debunked Russiagate story, which was taken on faith from unnamed intelligence sources. Bob also defended Julian Assange's earlier 2010 against government designs to arrest and imprison him, which did not please many Democrats, especially after the 2016 election. For taking an independent stand based on where the facts led him, Bob upset both Republican and Democratic partisans. That's because he left a legacy of strict nonpartisan journalism, really the only kind of journalism that there is, which this site has endeavored to continue. It led to personal attacks on Bob from Republicans and Democrats, oblivious to the fact he was critiquing their political enemies too. The attacks on this site for the same reasons have continued. So joining us today to help celebrate Bob Perry's and Consortium News's 25 years of achievement are Diane Dustin, Bob's wife who lived through it all, filmmaker and journalist John Pilger, Ray McGovern, a former CIA analyst, a close associate of Bob and an important contributor to the website, Nat Perry, one of Bob's sons who made major contributions to the development of the site. Spence Oliver, one of Bob's anonymous sources on the Iran-Contra story and Gareth Quarter, a longtime contributor to Consortium News. To start the program, we will hear from a supporter and friend of Consortium News and to Bob, film director Oliver Stone. And we'll have Oliver chat about Consortium News with his co-author of the untold history of the United States American University historian Peter Kuznick. Oliver and Peter, welcome. Oliver, before we drill down to the questions, um, why don't you just briefly say how you met Bob and how you first got introduced to Consortium News? Yeah, I met him at your dinner party, Peter, when we were, we, we hadn't started Untold History, it was just as a guest. And uh, he, uh, we talked about what was going on in Washington in the 90s, which seems like such ancient history now. Uh, but I got to know Bob basically through Consortium News because I started to read it. And the stories were, I, I heard of him in, with Newsweek and I knew Maynard Parker, who was his boss. He criticized Maynard Parker, among others, at Newsweek for being chicken and not going with his stories. And I know those people. And I know, I, I, I sense what kind of propriety exists around them. And I, so I know where this Washington sense of you don't cross this line. And I was, I felt that my whole life and all my work, it's, it's gotten worse. Uh, as you know, I went to the JFK case and it's impossible sometimes to argue with these people. Bob, uh, we never, I never discussed JFK with him, but it was clear that he was on to something with this Iran Contra because we were talking to some of the same people. And uh, it's a dirty, dirty story. It went deeper than ever got out. And Bob knew that. And uh, I mean, obviously it seems to me that Reagan was impeachable for treason at that point. And uh, certainly George H.W. Bush, the father, should have gone down that road and been prosecuted or at least accused and brought into this thing because Bob makes a big deal about how he found evidence later after he left, uh, after the case was closed and they were let off. But he made the point that the CIA brought out a IG report and uh, it was clear that the Russians had, the Russian documents had not been examined and the Russians knew quite a bit about the case. So it gets very complicated, but Bob was always with that case. He never gave it up. He was like a Sherlock Holmes and nothing, uh, nothing could stop him. I admired that tenacity, and that's when I got involved with him, uh, and I contributed to the organization, continued to love this, uh, love the writers for this consortium news. He started something that should continue in the tradition of, from my, from what my knowledge is of I.F. Stone, I'd say early in the 50s, and although I was a conservative, I certainly read some of his stuff and was shocked, and later Drew Pearson and Jack Anderson who that you may criticize them for certain things, but they did a hell of a job of waking me up. Uh, and we need those journalists without the John Pilger who's sitting here today is another one. We need these people to wake to go in, to go in and people don't do that. And it's stunning to me that 
That's, well, I guess I have to understand why it's scary. I mean, we know a lot of investigative reporters who, who do get lost, uh, who really get lost. I mean, I know a guy, uh, and I respect him, Tom O'Neill. Some people say he's crazy, but he's been going after the Manson case since the 1980s, 90s, and he's still, he's still in there. It's a rabbit hole, and that happens. Bob, thank God, got out of the rabbit hole, and as angry as he was, he was... He, he never gave up insisting that he had uh, the truth. And I'd like, even he went back to Iran Contra as late as a few weeks before he died. Well, you started with talking about Bob's work in Central America and exposing what was happening with the Contras and the drug running. Uh, it's interesting to me that in so many of your films, you also are very critical of mainstream media beginning with your first major feature film, Salvador. The Valerie Wildman character, uh, you really pillory there. But we go through some of your other movies like uh, Wall Street, JFK, Talk Radio, Natural Born Killers, and especially Snowden. And you've got this ongoing critique of the media and the lies that the media keeps foisting upon us. On the other hand, you talk about the truth tellers. And you and I both consider Bob in the tradition of the truth tellers. That also runs throughout all your movies, whether it's a Garrison or maybe we can go through all these characters who, uh, ending with Snowden, and you and I talk about Henry Wallace and others who speak truth to power. Uh, and, but, and it's interesting to me that you began that critique of the mainstream media uh, before uh, JFK came out, because you got attacked viciously for JFK, but you were going after these folks as early as Salvador and movies uh, before uh, JFK came out, also to some extent in Born on the Fourth of July. So uh, how do you see Bob in that tradition of truth tellers, people who stand up to the, the, the power establishment uh, and, and are willing to risk and actually pay a huge price often, as you did for uh, speaking truth to power? <laughs> That's a big question. I mean, Bob was at the forefront. He's one, one of the best. I would consider him right up there with, you know, with Pearson, as I said, Stone, Anderson. I mean, he sacrificed a lot. He was never into the money. He, he never was into the position. When I met him in Washington, he was quite, he was quite content to have a subscription service supporting his work and his, a base of people who read his stuff. There was no bigger ambition than to tell the truth is what I think of Bob. And in that regard, he's, you have to respect him enormously. He's, he's a treasure. He was a national treasure. Uh, the, uh, bear in mind that I was against the establishment with Salvador. What I saw in Central America, in those countries was, I felt very strongly that Ronald Reagan's was intending to go into Nicaragua and actually get rid of them. I mean, destabilize the place completely, try to, but if necessary, send troops. Because I saw a lot of troops in Honduras and in Salvador that were devoting themselves to the Honduras, to the Nicaragua situation. So it was clear that I thought that we were into another early Vietnam. It felt like, it just felt like it. The best thing that ever happened for that cause, of course, was the crash. The CIA, as usual, screwed up, screwed up in a big way because this fellow, the contractor who got shot down over Nicaragua, spilled the beans that he was working for the CIA. And that was somehow, that snapped, that was enough. And Bob covered that case too. And uh, the, the thing unraveled, and Reagan's last two years from 88 to, uh, from 86 to 88, uh, were lame. And he couldn't get things, he couldn't get legislation through. Very important that that happened. So truth tellers do work, even if they don't understand their, their, their position in the big picture. Certainly, uh, we know that case is so crucial now. I mean, what's going on with uh, not only Snowden, but more importantly, Assange. Assange is at the key of this, all this mess that's been going on for two years, it seems to me. And he's never been allowed to really, he doesn't want to talk or whatever. I don't know the details like maybe John Pilger could tell us, but he knows things that are invaluable about this. And I'm surprised that one or more candidates hasn't taken advantage of it by seeking to pardon him, but that would cause a furor. 
I understand, but it's an interesting, crucial case. I wish Bob were around to explain it in great detail like he would. I'm not anti-media, I was anti-establishment. And then when I did the JFK case, I did it out of anti, very strong feelings that we had been, he'd been assassinated for political purposes and he was a very dangerous man to them because he would be reelected. And after him came Bobby and after him possibly Teddy. It was a dynasty in the making. It was serious. They had to end this thing. When that came out, that, that is what brought the press down on me. It was not before that. They were, they were not attacking me. Yeah, Salvador they ignored, but still it got out. And then the other films did well. Wall Street was respected, so it was born on the 4th of July. But then, uh, and the doors too. But then uh, JFK was the end of that honeymoon, or whatever, the, the parole that I had. Uh, it never changed after 1992. It was really ugly and I was always discounted as a, uh, as a, uh, as a, a lone nut. <laughs> you know, I know what that feels like. Uh, but thank God people like you and many others uh, have supported me uh, all the way down to Snowden, which was my last film. Uh, Oliver, um, Bob spent much of the last five years of his life exposing the demonization of Russia and Putin talking about Russophobia and Russiagate and the, a different perspective on what happened in Ukraine. Uh, and, and he saw that as so crucial. Um, you've also been very much involved in that. Uh, you got attacked again for your four part interview with Putin. One of the things that Bob understood was the importance of seeing how the world looks, explain how the world looks through the eyes of our adversaries. Uh, which you've made an attempt to do also. Uh, but now, you know, beginning in January 2018, Secretary of Defense Mattis said that international terrorism is no longer the main threat to American national security. It's Russia and China. Uh, I was hearing on the television today, Fareed Zakaria talking again about Ru Russia's effort to uh, uh, discredit American democracy. That's what they're trying to do to sow seeds of dissent in America. Um, talk about a little bit about Russia and, why, and how that played such an important part in your thinking in recent years. Well, first of all, I just want to say Bob got it right away. He saw the Nazi, the neo-Nazi uh, influence in Ukraine. And he filled in the history of Ukraine back to World War II, which is you have to go there. You have to understand the tensions in Ukrainian society that came, came out in 2014. And it's a heartbreaking story. It's a heartbreaking story because I've never seen the new, it feels, it feels like 1946 Cold War again. It's just the Russians never did anything good in their life. They, they, and they don't even talk about the space shuttle anymore, but nothing I, in, and I'm talking mainstream, like New York Times to me has completely lost its credibility. I never, maybe I, I was wrong to believe in them anyway. Yeah, a lot of people say that we, because they did support the Vietnam War for a long time. But what they said about Ukraine was always, it wasn't even journalism, it was editorial writing in the first paragraph. The Russians being described in an objective story as sinister or uh, a, uh, uh, it's always about Putin. It's who Putin is, is always Russia. I don't know how you can conflate the two. But they never used to call Khrushchev Russia. They'd say Russia. I mean, with Putin, it's Putin's Russia. Putin's Russia, like he has complete control of this gigantic place. It's not that simple. And I'm glad I, I was able to, to go to the source uh, several times and get my four hours with Mr. P I got four hours, about 20 hours with Mr. Putin. And you just got to watch, nobody watches it except you can see it on Amazon, thank God. Thank God for Amazon, even though much criticized, but you can at least see what he is saying. And he speaks in his own voice, not with some dubbed thug translator, which the American news, news networks always put on his case. The Putin speaks for himself. He's a quiet, brilliant, thinking man. He's not at all the picture that is presented to the American public. I've been attacked by that for that interview as a stooge, uh, as an apologist, as a commie and all that. It goes on and on and on and it'll never go away. I love dictators. I bow down to dictators, Chavez, Castro, 
you know, the, all these three people I admire because they stood up to a sovereign empire of our own, our American empire, which is trying to end their sovereignty. And they don't, they just won't go along with it. And they're independent, very independent. They bristle when you talk to them about, would you have observers look at this? Because they feel the observers will never be straight and they're going to be crooked. But it's just, the reason I admire them is they were rebels and they, and they, and they're all strong men. And Castro was perhaps one of the strongest men I've ever met in my life. Chavez was too. You have, it's a lonely road to travel. And some of you know that road. And, uh, I guess I've always rooted for the underdog as a movie maker, and I like, and that's what the movies used to be. It used to be the underdog, right? The guy you never expected would come through. Matt Perry wrote, I'll quote, ultimately Bob was motivated by a concern over the future of life on Earth. As someone who grew up at the height of the Cold War, he understood the dangers of allowing tensions and hysteria to spiral out of control, especially in a world such as ours, with enough nuclear weapons to wipe out all life on the planet many times over. Uh, I think those powerful words apply to you uh, or me. Uh, and uh, I just, would you reflect on that and talk about how Bob saw his purpose in life and how you see yours in that same vein? Well, Bob was very upset, I think, that the because this Cold War that we've created is even more dangerous. And it's, it's useless, it's unnecessary because there's been no significant threat from any other source than us. Most of the uh, conflict and the tension in the world comes from us because we, we like to create things to a boil, it's to our advantage. We take advantage of color revolutions that we often are very deeply in, involved with to change governments, regimes that we don't like all around the world. The power of the United States is extraordinary. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm still amazed that we're able to finance this thing, although we're in debt and all that, but it seems like an impossible grasp that we have to keep our fingers everywhere, everywhere, literally, whether it's Burkina Faso or Ukraine, the North Pole, uh, all, all the, border, the countries, all the space surrounding China and Russia. It's, it's an enormous, it's an enormous empire and it's uh, without precedent in the world because of communications and because of cyber warfare, which we, we've wholly used again. We've used cyber warfare on the offensive again and again, starting as far as I know with the Israelis back in 2007, eight and nine when we were attacking Israel, uh, I mean, attacking Iran. Uh, so, Cyber warfare plus all the money, all the propaganda, the advertising. It's a, it's a huge proposition, Peter. It's a monster beyond belief. I'm, it's surprised. I think that the best summation of it was given actually by Harold Pinter back in his Nobel, Peace, his Nobel uh, Writer's Prize in 2007 or so, just before he died. He said, it's a, mir it's a miracle this thing happened. It's an act of hypnotism that has never been seen in the world before, that you have convinced the world, America has convinced the world that they are the good guys. Pinter got it, and a lot of people see it, but uh, not enough. So uh, the job of journalism is to spread that, spread that truth, like the ancient Christian missionaries spread the truth about their religion. That's uh, among the things that you and I go after in our untold history books and documentaries is this notion of American exceptionalism. Bob, when you reread his articles, he always understood the importance of putting things in historical context. I mean, he presented the historical background over and over again for the different topics that he was writing about. And you and I appreciate that importance of history and you probably more than anybody else in Hollywood have done historical films on historical topics and realizing that Americans have very little understanding of history and much of what they do think they know is wrong. Much of what you've done in terms of truth telling, what Bob did in terms of truth telling is based on a certain faith that the public will appreciate the truth and see the light, understand and act differently to 
change things and make a better world, which is what our goal has been. Uh, but there's some things that have happened recently that make that more questionable. The fact that half of Trump's supporters believe the QAnon conspiracy theory, half of them, the fact that where 35% of Republican voters before the election believe the election was fixed, 70% after the election believe the election was fixed. We've run into this problem with the public having no critical analytical capabilities, or at least part of the public having that. And we're in a situation now where you look at the Republican Party. This is a multi-part question. Uh, but Gore Vidal was asked a few years back, why Obama, when he was being so viciously attacked by the Republicans, did not respond in kind with equal outrage. And Gore Vidal said, Obama believes the Republican Party is a political party, when in fact it's a mindset like Hitler Youth, based on hatred, religious hatred, racial hatred. When you foreigners hear the word conservative, you think of kindly old men hunting foxes. They're not. They're fascists. You know, so we're up against the Republican Party that's turned into a fascist death cult of sorts with a public that goes along with some of this. And so how do you see our role collectively, all of us, John and Ray and Joe and everybody, as truth tellers up against a world in which people are not really, and some people at least, are not open to or capable of understanding, differentiating between truth and falsehood? This is a question I also would like you to take up after I leave, because I think I would love to hear the recorded answers of all these gentlemen and uh, participants. I don't quite agree with you, Peter. You know that I came from a Republican background, strong one, and I, you have come from the FDR side, and you converted me in many ways to your thinking. I understand it. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think the Republicans are all that bad as, as you call them a fascist party or a Nazi party. I think that's going a little bit too far. Sure, there's people like that in it, and they make themselves very loud, and generally speaking, they can't spell, and they write horrible letters to people and all make a lot of noise, but there's a lot of intelligent people, and I think they can be reached. Uh, the, and I think you're, going, you're barking after the wrong issue to suddenly declare that the election count is, mm -hmm. is absolutely correct because uh, all the mainstream media says it is. Uh, it doesn't work that way. I think it's very strange that all this that the 2016 election is so quickly forgotten uh, and where the Russians uh, manipulated the vote. All this, well, so what happened to the Russians? Didn't they manipulate some voting? I mean, it's apparently dismissed as an issue right away. It's very convenient for them. And I think a lot of Republicans doubt that. And they doubt, they doubt the, they wonder about the mail-in balloting because it's an old technique that's been used for a century. I mean, people would do that. They'd stuff the ballot box back in the 1870s in New York. Uh, and uh, who knows what's there. I mean, I believe that Biden won because of the numerics, but uh, again, I was surprised that Trump came so close, you see. So I think that's not an issue that you can easily uh, pinpoint. But don't forget that uh, in Bob's case, one of the great things Bob did was, for me, he revised the, 19, uh, the 1968 election completely. I had to rethink it because, uh, when I did my Nixon movie, I was thinking that the Bay of Pigs had something. I really was what Nixon was hiding in his in those tapes, that 19 and a half minute missing gap. I do believe after reading Bob and seriously thinking about how Nixon pulled off that Vietnamese uh, withdrawal from the peace process, and that was very effective. And I think that might have made the difference against Hubert Humphrey. So in that case, uh, I do think that was what was Nixon may well have been hiding during Watergate was his involvement in that, in that uh, call it conspiracy or call it, it was really a pernicious, it was treason. It was what Reagan did in 19, uh, the 1980 election, if indeed, I, I do believe the October surprise that was reported on, uh, so I think Bob did too, that Reagan held the hostages back uh, through, by talking directly to the Iranians and then paying them off with arms to fight the Iraqi war and the Iranians pay him in cash, of half of which he gave to the Contras. So I, I think there's a dirty deal around the 1980 election and the 1968 election. I think our country has been back and forth. I think the 2000 election was stolen. I do. Uh, I, I think that's 
The Supreme Court did a very bad thing, set a terrible precedent, and we're in a hole ever since that moment, certainly because of the policies of George W. Bush. So there's been a lot of chicanery through all these elections, except maybe, I think Obama was pretty clean in 2008. I think so, and so forth and so on. Let me just follow up a little. We talk about all of those incidents in untold history in some depth, as Bob did in a lot of his writings. Uh, but when we look at this election, Oliver, you probably have spent more time with Vladimir Putin than any other American. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we look at this election, and there's been very little discussion about Russian interference. There's a lot of warning in the beginning that it was going to happen. Then there's been nothing about yeah, that it's that's recently. Right. And, and I, but I saw opportunities where if Putin really wanted to help Trump, he could have done so. He could have accepted American terms on the New START Treaty, which Putin rejected, and that would have given Trump his ability to brag about a big foreign policy victory. He could have supported Trump when it came to Hunter Biden, but he mm -hmm. didn't. He contradicted Trump on Hunter Biden. I mean, I just look at the fact that I was on mainstream Russian television a couple times a day for the past several weeks during the election, and they knew that I was so strongly anti-Trump uh, and accepting of Biden, even though he's not my kind of guy. But um, so how do you see Russia positioning itself now in terms of the United States and the possibility of a Biden presidency or the reality of a Biden presidency and, and the kind of tense world we have in which US-Russian relations are at a very, very dangerous point now with the hands of the doomsday clock at 100 seconds before midnight. You know, I will simply, I know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a the, what do they call it? The idiot uh, clown or whatever they, of the, the belief. Useful idiot. What, uh, what do they call idiot. it? Useful, I know I'm a useful idiot, but I will repeat what Mr. Putin said in his interview very, very clearly time and again. And I asked him time and again, it is not in Russia's interest to, to go into the American presidential election. First of all, it, they, it would be a disaster if something were found out and it would be a, a major issue, which it, did, it didn't become, thank God, but almost. But he said, we don't, that our, our, our problem with the United States, we try to deal with every president, but Democrat or Republican, we, we're willing to negotiate. And, but we have a problem. There's a system in America that is heavier than any president. And whether it's Obama in the White House or Trump or Bush or Clinton, it doesn't matter to the Russians at this point. They see where the, the, the they see the writing on the wall, as they say. And Clinton, who had no beef with Russia, suddenly he loves Yeltsin, and of course, he helps him he he helps him fraudulently to to win that election in '96. But uh, even Clinton, I mean, it doesn't make a difference. So they have to deal with. They know the United States is hostile. They know there's now they have 13 NATO countries around the, in the proximity to, the, to Russia against them. And probably, and who knows what's coming up in Belarus, who knows what's gonna happen in Ukraine. It's not easy, but they're on their guard and they keep, for a very little amount of money, they build a huge nuclear force that is equivalent to our trillion dollar, uh, our trillion dollar effort every year to prepare for war. The Russians have a, what, $60 billion budget? I mean, think about, uh, they're very smart. And thank God, because if, if not, there'd be even more problems. If we could run over them, as we think, some people think, we'd really be in the, into a hot spot, I think. I, I would never underestimate the Russians. I never, never, never. They're strong against the Nazis. They were strong against the French. And they're gonna be strong against anybody trying to, to, to take over or to beat them or to, take something from them. And I think we're very lucky that Mr. Putin is a very sensible man and he listens. And at the same time, he's not hot headed enough to get upset that he's been called a thug by this guy, uh, Mr. Biden, the new, the latest uh, man to trash Russia. Every, I guess he thinks I, every American president has to trash us. He once said to me, you know, I, I probably sound outrageous, but we feel like Jews in World War II. <laughs> Always Russia. Yeah, you would think that Biden is making such an effort to reach out to the Republicans who have been so vicious toward him, he could make an effort to reach out to Putin now and try to have a real reset and uh, ease some of these problems. And 
work together on some of the problems that confront us. Yeah, he's offered again and again. Listen, I do have to run now, but please, sound. I'd love to get the rest of this tape when, it, when it's. I'd love to see what my the, the panel. We'll, we'll make it available to you, uh, Oliver. Thank you so much. We. Thank I'm you, sure John. everyone else has a question for you, but you don't have time. If like John Pilger wants to ask you something. Thank you, John. Thank you, All Ray. Right. I Thank you, Oliver. Good. And Gareth. <laughs> I'm going to uh, never forget a lone and, nut as a badge of honor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.